Good evening, everyone, and welcome to the Grace and Encounter series. We're planning to have a wonderful weekend, praising the Lord together, higher and higher. So I'm going to invite you, oh, I'm going to welcome everyone here, everyone online. We'll get more welcome later, but thank you for being here with us. We're going to have a wonderful time together, praising the name of the Lord. We're going to sing our opening song, Blessed Be Your Name. We're going to bless the Lord today. Phil Kemp, 
as we know, the Filipino Church, Filipino Canadians celebrating their 30th anniversary also this weekend. So we definitely congratulate our sister, our baby church, because we know that Phil Can and uh, Victoria at one time were together, and then 30 years ago they started a ministry, and we congratulate uh, the wonderful ministry they do right there in downtown. But folks, um, tonight is the beginning of an exciting series, Grace Encounters. I've had a chance to listen to Pastor Paul Llewellyn for actually a number of years. I worked uh, very close to him there in Ontario Conference. And many things, many years have gone by, and it's been 24 years since I started in Ontario. Uh, and I'm not surprised that today he comes to us as the president of the Seventh-day Adventist Church in Canada. And you know, of course, we sometimes think of this as an administrative title, but pastor has years of experience of working with young people. He was teaching in our Adventist school. He was camp director. He was revival speaker. And a lot of young people, Pastor Paul, uh, I hope you know that they, from Emmanuel, they would say, Pastor, we just went to the camp and we heard Pastor Paul. That was exciting. You need to hear him, you know. And that was the first time I've, uh, I've heard of uh, the good news of just sharing the gospel. And you will uh, hear that through the stories. Pastor has many amazing, inspiring stories. And uh, we pray that this will also inspire you tonight. Uh, but... Every time, we have four presentations, today is the first one. And please, uh, you have the bulletins, we want to invite you tomorrow at 10 o'clock. We have Bible studies, we have different Sabbath school classes. And by the way, if you didn't know, in Victoria we have Ukrainian Sabbath school class, Spanish Sabbath school class, Portuguese, English, potentially even Korean. We, all these tables represent different languages and we're just thrilled to have uh, uh, and uh, more and more uh, people coming and joining us uh, for just Sabbath school. And then, of course, 11 o'clock is part two. And then we have one of the, I said, the healthiest and the best uh, potlucks uh, in the entire world. And it's going to be here. You can see those tables will be breaking. So, folks, if you're watching, it's not enough. You have to come, taste, and see, all right? So that's uh, going to be at 1230, the potluck. And then the third presentation, 6 o'clock. And then Sunday morning, we're going to have beautiful breakfast served and the final presentation. And so uh, I think uh, you will get to know Pastor Paul, uh, but now tonight and every, every, year, every time he preaches we'll have special music as well. And I would like to invite uh, Sister Kadisha to come at this time and uh, praise God in song. Um, and she's going to say the song and then I pray that, you know, the spirit of prophecy says that prayer is also expressed in music. In music, every time there is a there is singing, there is that's why people love to use Psalms of David. There are also songs. When we sing, where someone else is singing, this is when I believe we can raise our voice uh, together with the lyrics and the person and pray together. So this is like a prayer. And I invite Kadisha to come, and then Pastor Paul will come right after that. God bless you. Thank you for coming.
serving in the Navy here, uh, in Esquimalt, we went hiking yesterday. And um, the one hike I did not want to go on by the uh, China Beach hike, he took me on. And there's a lot of roots in that hike. And still today, if you see me being a little stiff, it's because my joints are still healing from that hike, going down to the water and then coming back up. I know for you youngins, that might be a, an easy thing to do, but for me, I used to play football when I was younger, and um, my high school football days were not good to my body. And today, I feel the pain in my knees. So if you see me a little bit stiff, it's because my son decided to pick the hardest hike, just as a joke for his father. But anyways, wonderful to be here with you all uh, today. Uh, it's just great uh, to see you all here. It's great to be here at uh, Lakeview Christian School. Um, good friends with Scott there, over there, the principal and, and the teachers. Um, a lot of the teachers that have come through here have been young people that I have known. And it's true, I started my career out, uh, my ministry, I shouldn't say career because um, I taught, I started out in the teaching ministry. And I say the teaching ministry because there's two types of ministries within their church. There's pastoral and teaching. And teachers are just, a part, uh, just as much a part of ministry as pastors are. Uh, my one of our vice presidents at the Seventh-day Adventist Church of Canada is named Cyril Mullen. And Cyril was the chaplain and youth uh, pastor of the church right next to where I taught for uh, eight years, Crawford Adventist Academy. And he came to me one day and he said, Paul, how in the world do you get your students to move along um, to get to know Jesus so fast? I said, simple, Cyril. You have them for half an hour to 45 minutes once a week. I said, I have them for an hour, five days a week in my classroom. And so we got to talk about Jesus. So I'm a big fan of talking about Jesus. And I think that the more we talk about Jesus, the more we get to know who Jesus is. And I'm an even bigger fan of the word called good news. Uh, we as a people, we've heard the term good news, and then basically the good news in its Greek form is called gospel. I like good news. I really get excited about good news. In fact, my heart starts to leap when I hear good news. When I hear that somebody has gotten a job or, or got into the school that they want to go or they're engaged to get married, my heart jumps for joy. I love good news. But sometimes we get bad news, and bad news is not fun to hear, especially when you get those phone calls when one of your loved ones has passed away. And those are the phone calls that I remember getting. I've gotten three of them in my, la my life. One for my mother, one for my brother, and one for my dad. Uh, and those were, were hard phone calls. But with every single bad news experience we have, I want to tell you there's good news out there. And I want to tell you the good news is really good news. It's not bad news. I, I don't know if I have a clicker. I'll just say to advance all that stuff. 
It's somewhere over here. <laughs> oh, there it is. I, I see. Gotcha. Oh, okay. Thank you very much. Uh, but like I said, good news is really good news. If somebody is telling you good news and they say, but, that means they're about to insert bad news into it. But when it talks about good news in the Bible, it's always good news. I want to tell you a story. I love stories. Uh, all my life I've told stories. I am a person that remembers stories. Uh, there's some people that like to memorize Bible verses. I like to memorize the thoughts that are in the Bible. I remember the thought patterns better than I do the word patterns. Maybe I'm dyslexic, maybe it's something else, but I remember stories really well. And my favorite storyteller is Jesus. Jesus loved to tell stories. And so I like to tell stories too. I also like stories because it's easier for people to understand. Well, one of my favorite authors, um, he passed away many years ago, but uh, he was my wife's pastor down in Azure Hills, California, when she attended Loma Linda, not to become a dentist or doctor, but become a hygienist. And as she was down there uh, studying, she went to Azure Hills Church, and um, Morris Vendon was there. And I always used to love to listen to Morris Vendon, because he loved to talk about good news. And as a young person, it was really exciting to hear good news. And he always used to preach in such a manner that anybody could understand. He had a daughter that was very challenged in life. And he wanted to make sure he would preach so that she would understand. And so that's why I love stories. I want to tell you the first story I want to tell you. Um, and I'm going to tell you a whole bunch of stories. I wasn't going to tell you the story at the beginning, but I did share it with the teachers this morning. There was a time when Jesus was walking through a, a, a village or a city, and a blind man was there. Now, before Jesus came along, there were no healings of uh, blindness before this. Jesus was the first that really did healing of the blind, because it was really a truly an amazing miracle that you could not refute. And there was a guy there that had, uh, he wasn't born blind, I don't think, uh, and he was blind, and they brought him to Jesus, and Jesus did an amazing thing, which was really weird back then, but he spat into the guy's eyes. Now, for us here in North America, we would go, ooh, we would take, you know, some, you know something wash out our eyes because of that. I have a feeling Jesus spat in the eyes because maybe his eyes were very crusty. And if Jesus wanted him to open the eyes, he would have to remove some of the gunk from that was in his eyes. And so Jesus spat in his eyes, and the man opened his eyes. And the reason why I think he was sighted at some time in his life, because he said, Jesus, I see people walking around, but they look like trees. They look like stalks of broccoli, probably, if he was using our language today. And of course, that really bothered me that Jesus, why? Was your power not working well that day? Were you, were you off? Did you not get enough sleep that night? Why didn't you heal the guy like that and make him totally healed? Um, but I wasn't there to ask the question. But I know whenever Jesus did something, it was a lesson for us who would read it or hear the story. And so he looked at the man... He did the same thing, he touched him, did whatever Jesus did, and he said, open your eyes again, and the guy was fully healed. I really believe with all my heart that there are many, many Christians out of many different faiths, even other religious groups, that are only seeing a partial picture. Their picture is not true clarity of who God really is, and who was in front of this man who she, he saw, the first one he would see when he opened his eyes would have been Jesus, and he saw Jesus that looked like a tree. And when Jesus touched him again, he could see Jesus clearly. I really believe that within Christianity today, many of us need that second touch of Jesus to see Jesus clearly. We're going along in our spiritual lives, and we have a partial picture of Jesus, but we don't really know who he really is. We have not experienced the good news for ourselves or maybe we did a long time ago, but we've lost it, and we've gone a different direction in life. And what Jesus wants to do is touch us again so we can see him clearly. Because when you see Jesus clearly, when you see him clearly, you understand what God is really like. So, way back in, like I said, I'm a, I'm a history buff. I do have a minor in American history. Uh, more importantly, Civil War history. I 
loved to study the Civil War, and I have a degree in history, minor in history. So I like historical facts. And in the Bible, it talks about a siege uh, in the city of Samaria, where when they would come to surround a city, what they would do was they wouldn't come and just bombard the city, because they know that if they would send soldiers up to a city wall, that they would send rocks and arrows and spears and, and boiling water or oil over the city wall, and you would lose a lot of soldiers. So what became the in thing to do when people went to battle was they came with about a year to two year supply of food. And what they did was they camped all around the city and they prevented anybody from coming out or anybody going in. And if they could stop up the wells inside the city, they would do that too. And they would just camp on the outside. Life would go on on the outside, but eventually inside the city, the people would run out of supplies. And it had gotten so bad in the city that people were actually resorting to cannibalism, eating their own children, more yet babies. They were eating pigeon dung. Outside the city were four lepers. Those four lepers lived outside the city, and they had the city walls here, they had the people inside starving to death. They probably had it a little bit better on the outside, these four lepers, because they were probably eating the plants that grew outside. They were probably eating the grasshoppers that were jumping around on the plants or what was left of the plants. They might have been even eating the mice that were going along. If they went outside the city, that's where the enemy was. When they had eaten every single living plant that they had out there in, uh, around the city, there was nothing more to eat and they were starving. The four of them had a council and they looked at each other and they said, guys, we're in a predicament. If we stay here, we're going to die. So here's our options. We can go knock on the city walls and go inside, but I have a feeling because we're ostracized because we're lepers and we have skin disease, we might become tomorrow night's meal. And they said, the only other option we have is to surrender to the enemy. And they said, well, I don't want to go inside the city because I don't want to be a, uh, a meal. Let's take our chances of surrendering to the enemy, the Ar Arameans. Let's go over to where they are and they might just let us live and give us a little bit of food. So I don't know why they did it, but they made something with a white flag and they walked over into the camp, the enemy camp. And as they walked into the enemy camp, you know, hello, we're surrendering. Hello, everybody. And they're yelling and they see tents all over the place. Fires are still going. There's food heating up by each tent and the fire there, but there's no one around. You see, in the middle of the night, God did something special there that the people thought the people inside the city had hired another army to come against them. And they thought it was a vast army and they took off all the way, I think, to the Jordan River. And so those four lepers looked around and they said, guys, there's food here. So if you haven't eaten for a while, it didn't take long to fill you up. But they went over to one of the nearby fires where there was food there and they ate to the heart's core. They were just eating and eating and eating and they were laying back there going, wow, this is good. Yesterday we had our last grasshopper and today we're eating all this wonderful food, this lentils with garlic and onions in it. They were just having a great time. And then they looked around and as they looked around, they noticed that there was gold, there was clothing, there were animals, there were swords, there were all the riches that these, this opposing army had come in to wait till these people would starve to death and then they would go and take care of the rest of the starving people. And so those lepers, they took up as much as they could, they ran to a nearby cave and they dumped it there and they tried to cover it with rocks and then they ran back to the enemy encampment and they did that this again. Along about the third or fourth time that they were pilfering and, and plundering because nobody was there to stop them, they got back to the cave and they said, guys, something's wrong here. Something's wrong. And they said, what? 
they said, there's a problem here. We're full. We have all these riches that will take care of us till the day we die. Even though we're lepers, we have enough to take care of us. We got coins, we got gold, we got clothing, we got food. We have everything we need that will take care of us till the day we die. This is a day of good news. That's what the Bible says. And if we keep this good news to ourselves, we will perish. Those people back there in the city, even the people that don't like us and that kicked us outside of the city because of our leprosy, they're dying right now. And so they devised a plan to go back over and they told the guards and the guards were looking really suspiciously. They actually sent their last horse and rider out there to see if what they said was true. And before they knew it, they were opening the city gates and the people that were starving inside the city were going out to plunder the enemy encampment that had been surrounding them for a few months. When you understand the words that those lepers use, this is a day of good news. That's what it means for Christians today when we start to understand the good news. The good news is not just good news, and I, I, I know that that's the way it's translated in the Bible, but I like to call it great news. And the great news is really great news. And it's not attached to bad news. And, and there's so many, so many times that we will hear people purposely attach bad news to good news, and I don't like that. Good news is all good news. And I know that the rumor goes, too bad the good news wasn't bad news, because if it was bad news, you know how rumors spread, people would spread it faster. But we understand that bad news sp spreads fast, rumors spread even faster. But when somebody is truly sharing good news, and you're happy on the inside because of you have good news, you'll want to share it with other people. Wait, just... Okay. Told, told that. All right. Paul writes about the good news, and he says this in Romans. This letter is from Paul. Um, I have the same name as Paul. Uh, it's not coincidental, but I do like Paul's writings. I think Paul understood the gospel message that most of, uh, of biblical writers. And he says, I'm a slave of Christ, chosen by God to be an apostle and sent out to preach his good news. So Paul was specially sent to the Gentile people, not to the Jewish people, but especially to the Gentiles, to preach the good news so that the people that weren't accessing the good news would have access to the good news. He goes on to say, God promised this good news long ago through his prophets and the Holy Scriptures. So it means all the scriptures before Paul's time were proclaiming the good news too. It's sad because I don't think the people got it very well. The good news is about his son. So who's about good news about? Jesus. In his earthly life, he was born into King David's family line. And he was shown to be the Son of God when he was raised from the dead by the power of the Holy Spirit. He is Jesus Christ our Lord. So Paul's basically saying this good news is summed up in one man. And he said, um, let me say this first, that I thank my God through Jesus Christ for all of you because your faith in him is being talked about all over the world. God knows how often I pray for you Day and night I bring you and your needs in prayer to God, whom I serve with all my heart by spreading the good news about his son. So Paul seems really hooked on this good news. He talks about it a lot. He mentions the good news a lot. And let's see what else he says. I want you to know, dear brothers and sisters, that I plan many times to visit you, but I was prevented until now. I want to work among you and to see spiritual fruit. So Paul's telling this good news so he can ultimately see in this church in Rome spiritual fruit. Just as I've seen among other Gentiles. So he's saying, I've seen it work in other people. They've heard this good news. Something happens inside and all of a sudden they start bearing good fruit. See, when you, uh, my, my father-in-law has, I think, 15 fruit trees. Uh, Brad, you grow Fruit, you're successful at that because the last, when the last time I saw you, you brought a huge basket full of, of fruit when at one of the board meetings, apples, and they were good apples. I took a few for my uh, flight home. 
Um, my father-in-law and I don't have the same luck with that. We've pruned the trees, we've done everything we can do, but we're not getting good fruit on these trees. In fact, the squirrels are eating the fruit before we can uh, harvest any of the fruit. And I think we had eight apples this year from the three or four apple trees that we had. We had plums and pears. It didn't do well. But Paul is saying, if you truly understand the good news, you will bear good fruit. And so we want to know what this fruit is that Paul wants us to, to, to do. Let's, let's look on. He says, for I'm not ashamed of the good news. So Paul's not ashamed of this. He's not, he's not trying to hide this or anything like that. He's proclaiming it wherever he goes. He says, I want to tell you about this good news about Christ. It is the power of God at work, saving everybody who believes. The Jew first, and then the Gentile. This good news tells us how God makes us right in his sight. So Paul's starting to break down with this good news. It's us being come, becoming right in God's sight. This is accomplished from start to finish by faith. So Paul's telling another key to the good news. It's faith. As the scripture says, it is through faith that a righteous person has life. So what God wants us to do, what he wanted Paul to do, was to share this good news. And hopefully the people that were listening would hear this good news and say, I want it too. And when they say, I want it too, that's the faith experience opening up in their lives. And there's another, people, uh, another group of uh, people that heard the good news. It's Adam and Eve. Adam and Eve is where the sin problem started on this earth. Now, whether you believe it's a literal story or, or a figurative story, the results are still the same. When Adam and Eve disobeyed God, sin came into this world. One of the results of sin, actually two of the results, is we start to become very selfish. We start to think only in our own realm, what's best for me. Adam and Eve saw the direct results of their sin because their son took the life of their other son. And basically they saw what sin would lead to. Sin would lead to death. But the amazing thing is, the day Adam and Eve decided to disobey and eat the fruit of the knowledge of good and evil, the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, God did not leave them alone that day. There was good news even though they had partaken of bad news. Even though the whole world would now be filled with this bad news, God came looking for them that evening. In the cool of the, of the setting sun, God came down to the garden. Now, he didn't see his good friends Adam and Eve around, so he had to call their names. Adam and Eve, where are you? Adam and Eve were hiding behind a tree or a rock or something like that. God had to coax them out. Because even though they had chosen another path for this world, God still was coming to rescue them. He wanted to tell them good news. He did tell them the results of sin. He did say to them what would happen because they had chosen sin. But he also gave them good news about a coming Savior. A Savior that would come and give us back the good news that sin had taken away from us. And so today, people, even Adam and Eve saw the good news. You and I have access to that good news too. We can experience that good news in our lives over and over again. And it says, um, oh, I already, didn't I read that? Yes, I did. That was about the, uh, the, the lepers. I wanted to tell you a story. I want to end on this story. And I want to end basically on uh, what happened to me. I grew up a Christian uh, young person. Um, my mother had uh, been part of the Christian church for a long time. Uh, when she married my father, who did not believe in Christianity, even though she met him at church one Saturday morning, taking his mother to church, which became my grandmother, uh, she met my dad at church, and within a few weeks they were engaged to be married. But my dad didn't want anything to do with Christianity. They got married and uh, moved to Prince Edward Island, uh, where I was born. My dad was originally from Prince Edward Island. 
And my mom would faithfully bring us to church and drag my dad to church too. Uh, still as a little baby, I was uh, dedicated in the Charlottetown Seventh-day Adventist Church back then. And I remember growing up, but when my dad took a transfer uh, in the Canadian military to Germany, um, we all moved to Germany. And my mom didn't go to church because she didn't want to sit in church all day or for the morning service or wherever it was and listen to German because she didn't understand German. And so she kind of drew away from, from the Lord. But when we moved back to Ottawa, Ontario, to the nation's capital, where my dad was transferred there, I remember the day my mom said, Paul and Rob, that was my brother's name, were going to church. What? What's that? I was just a little kid. And she dragged us to church, and we were just like, um, we're, we're missing Saturday morning cartoons for this. And But lucky enough, the pastor had a son that was just wired a different way. And when he would go to church, this kid was three or four years old, he would turn the hymnal upside down and sing just la, la, la from the top of his lungs. And my brother and I would just go to church just to watch that the pastor's young son. We thought it was so entertaining. We would miss Saturday morning cartoons just for that. God was doing something to my mom. God started doing something to my whole family. At an early age, I accepted Jesus Christ as my Savior because I wanted the good news. I didn't understand all the theological stuff going on, and I still remember the last Bible study I had with Pastor Glenn Corkum. Glenn Corkum was looking at me, and he was talking to me about something really complicated in the book of Revelations. And I was just looking at him and said, what in the world are you talking about? And I just remember he just gave a sigh, and he said, Paul, do you love Jesus? I said, I love Jesus with all my heart, mind, and soul. And he said, you're ready for baptism, Paul. And I remember him baptizing me. And that was a great experience in my life. I loved the Lord. But as I moved into my teenage days, and you know how it is when you're a teenager. When you're a tween or a teen, you think the whole world is looking at you. You get very self-conscious. You get very focused on yourself. And I became very focused on myself. And I still remember going to church and not being able to live at the standard of everybody that I saw. And I got really disillusioned. I was going to a Christian school, and this was about uh, grade grade nine, and everybody else was a good, diehard Christian except me. I was struggling. I was just struggling in my life. I became so disillusioned. Everything was negative that I saw around me. That I basically told God, I said, God, I'm giving up. I can't do it anymore. I can't live the way you want me to live. I can't be at that standard of a Christian that everybody I go to school is with, that everybody I go to church is with, and I'm going to give up. I still remember the day I told my mom, I'm not going to church today. And I tell you the things we say to mothers that breaks their hearts. That was one of them. And then I said to my mom, I said, Mom, I'm not going to the Christian school, Toronto Junior Academy anymore, which I ended up going back and teach at for eight years. And my mom just said, well, where are you going to go? I said, I'm going to go to C.W. Jeffries, the local public school. It was around that same time, everything started to hit me at the same time. I had a cousin, uh, Carl, one of the brightest guys I knew. And I, my, my cousin was about 10 years older than me. And I really looked up to him an awful lot. He was smart, he was intelligent, he was funny, he was into photography, he, he, was, he, he knew how to make bombs. And I'm dead serious, he knew how to make bombs. In fact, he nearly blew one of his neighbors up. And he had a criminal record because the cops knew he knew how to make bombs. In fact, when he went to school down in the United States, he had a knock at his door by somebody and it was a branch of the American police force and they said don't make any bombs here and he said I won't my cousin around that time had started getting involved with um, a following of Aleister Crowley it was called the OTO and my cousin had been started to get heavily involved in drug use and my brother and I just looked up to my cousin 
And I still remember the, the Friday uh, night we were over at my aunt and uncle's place. And my cousin Carl took us up for a walk and, and introduced me into the drug world. I was in grade 10 at that time. And I just, I didn't do it because it was fun. I just did it because my cousin was doing it. And around the same time, my cousin Carl tried to introduce the occult world to my brother and I. My brother took, got into it a lot more seriously. I just listened to it. But Alistair Crowley um, watched over an organization and practiced witchcraft. And that's what I heard coming out from my cousin's life. And about the same time as I was going to public school, I, I, I really liked acting. And my theater arts teacher uh, really took a shine to me. And she said, Paul, you have a future in acting. In fact, we were getting ready for a play one day, and she said, uh, Paul, a friend of mine, Peter Pringle, is coming, and he's coming here just to hear you. Now, for the older generation that's here, that's probably over 60, you might remember the name Peter Pringle. And I remember Peter Pringle coming out to see me in a play that I was doing, and he came to meet me after, and he said, Paul, um, Ira, which was my theater arts teacher, we have a group of people we want you to meet. You see, they met once or twice a week, and they had a, uh, they were following a, a guru in India at that time. And all these things started to bombard me. My cousin was trying to pull me into the occult world. My teachers were trying to pull me into an ashram or uh, into the um, guru world. All these things started happening at the same time. By the time I got to grade 11, and you know when you do a little bit too many drugs, you get this thing called the munchies. I'm a big guy, but I'm a skinny version of what I used to be. And when I was in grade 11, I was six foot tall. I'm six foot four now, I'm trying to give you perspective. I'm under 270 pounds, and I know some of you are just looking, whoa, that's three times as much as I weigh. But I used to be a lot heavier. When I was in grade 11, I weighed about 330 pounds and I was the center player on our football team. And I remember coming home from practice one day, and as I was coming home from practice, uh, we lived six stories up, and I never took the, the, um, the elevator, I would always take the stairs. And as I was walking up the stairs, you know, when you're smoking, uh, when you're doing drugs, you're doing marijuana, your lungs are not in good shape. And so as I'm going up the stairs, I am huffing and puffing, <sighs> and I stopped on the fourth floor. I'm 16 years old. And I'm going, I'm about to have a heart attack. And as I'm sitting there on the stairs, hadn't talked to God for about two years, I said, God, you're going to have to help me or I'm going to die. I made it back to the top of the stairs. And that night, it was a Monday night that we had football practice on Monday nights. And that there... I sat down to watch TV, and my mom came out with her tape recorder. She had this long stereo uh, small system that had two decks on it, and she came out, and she sat down, and she started playing a tape while I was trying to watch TV. So as I'm watching TV, my mom's listening to this tape, and I'm trying to watch TV. So I go over, that's when you had to get up and go and turn the channel up. I went and turned up the TV, and my mom would turn up the tape recorder, and I would turn up the TV, and this war would go back on. She was listening to some speaker that was talking about healthful living and talking about Jesus. And I was very angry because I wanted to watch TV. My mom turned off the tape player, she got up, and she went into her bedroom. I knew what my mom did. My mom went into that bedroom to pray for her son. On Tuesday night, I sat down to watch TV, and my mom comes up with her red cassette player, and she sits down, and she starts listening to the other tape from that same speaker. He was talking about healthful living, and he was talking about Jesus Christ. And I was like, oh, do I have to listen to this? So the game went on. I turned it up. My mom turned it up. I turned it up. I turned it up. The TV had more power than the little tiny cassette tape player. And my mom got up, 
and went into her bedroom and I knew what she went there for. She said, oh, she's praying for me. Wednesday, the same thing happened. Thursday, I sat down to watch TV and my mom came out with a cassette player and she pushed the play button and I turned the volume up. She turned her volume up. I turned my volume up. She turned her volume up. And the same thing happened. My mom got up and went into the bedroom to pray for me. I went and turned off the television. I said, whatever my mom's listening to, this guy sounds good. And I went over to the cassette player and I turned it down because I did not want my mom to listen to me that I was listening to her cassette tape and I pushed play and the speaker said, if you've given up on your health and you've given up on God, why don't you just pray right now and ask Jesus to help you out where you are? That's all I heard. I didn't listen to an hour of the tape. I just pushed play, listened to the next 30 seconds, and I pushed stop. And I said, I'm going to give it a try. Because if I don't give God a try, I'm going to die. And so right there I prayed. I said, God, I'm overweight. I'm doing drugs. My cousin's trying to introduce me to the occult. My, my teachers are trying to introduce me to the Eastern mysticistic uh, religions of the day. This is your chance, God. That's all I said. It wasn't a long prayer. It wasn't this or that. It was just like, if you're going to do it, God, you're going to have to do it now. There was an instantaneous change starting to come over me. All of a sudden, my mind started to get cleared up. When my brother and my cousin were offering me drugs, I, I, I said, I can't, it's, it's awful. I don't have a good experience. You guys might be floating around enjoying yourselves, but to me, it makes me sick. I don't want it. My theater arts teacher, I said, oh, I'm not joining that. Uh, that has no value whatsoever. I told my cousin, I said, you know, Carl, you used to be a brilliant guy. My, my, my cousin was in Mensa. Um, if you know what Mensa is, it's for the, the, the geniuses. They get around, they talk about, you know, high level IQ things that the normal people don't talk about. And my cousin was very bright. He had a huge IQ. Uh, went to Kingsway College, he was one of the smartest students that went to school there, went to Andrews University, smartest students. Uh, when he went to Rochester Institute of Technology to take photography, he met a witch there that introduced him to Aleister Crowley. And from that point on, it was downhill. About three years ago, my, uh, my cousin in Kelowna got a phone call that her brother, they had found her brother dead in uh, one of the districts of uh, Vancouver, the, you know, the districts where all the drug addicts hang out. My cousin had died in a bathtub. Uh, my cousin didn't, my living cousin didn't want to know how he died or anything like that, so I filled out the forms on the coroner's office because I wanted to see the autopsy report. My brilliant cousin, who I really looked up to, died all alone. Um, he had just shot up crystal meth. He was high and his heart stopped working. I want to tell you today, people, if you follow that sinful path, that, that, that path that brings us down the bad news, that's our end result. But I will say, I was praying one day and I said, Lord, nobody was there to hold my cousin's hand when he passed away. And in the quietness of my prayer, I heard God speak and he said, Paul, I was there. I said, really, God? You were there with my drug addict cousin? And he said, Paul, I didn't want him to be alone, so I came close to him at that time. You know, people, we have a God that cares for us. A God that cares for a teenage boy that in that the next six months of my life, I went down to the weight that I'm at right now, which is under 170 pounds. I started running six miles a day. My life transformed during the summer months from grade 11 to grade 12. I told my mom who worked at Branson Hospital at the time, Mom, I'm coming to have lunch with you. And she was so excited that her son was coming to have lunch with her. And we sat down for lunch and we're eating lunch there. And I said, Mom, can I go back to Crawford Adventist Academy? And I still saw that, I still remember the tears going down my mom's face. She's going, what, Paul? 
she said, I want to go back and be a part of a Christian school. I don't want the occult world. I don't want the things that I like my theater arts teacher was trying to lead me in. I want to be about around godly people. See, when I had left Toronto Junior Academy, which became Crawford Adventist Academy during the time I'd left, I was so disillusioned with all the teachers that are there. I said, they're the, the biggest bunch of hypocrites. And the day I went back to Crawford Adventist Academy, I was like, wow. How did God change all these teachers and all my friend students? He didn't do anything to them. He changed me. But I want to tell you something, people. The good news will change you permanently. You, you see, there's the, and I'll mention it now, because Paul mentioned, he says, if you by faith take hold of that good news, there's fruit at the end. And, and I love the, uh, ex, the uh, what we've seen, I'm going to see if I have, have it here, I thought I put it in, maybe I said the wrong, one minute, it's catching up. Not there. Not there? Is there any other slide after this? Okay, there, there is. Anyways, in Galatians chapter 5, Paul, who wrote Romans, talks about the fruit of the Spirit. The fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, gentleness, Self-control, there's, there's a few others I miss, and I always miss something because it just doesn't snap all the time in my brain. But if you accept this good news, and you let Jesus do the work in your life that he wants to do, it results in becoming a more loving, joyful, patient, peaceful, gentle person. If you find in your life that you're battling to have joy in your life or love in your life for other people, you might need the touch of Jesus again. Maybe you haven't been to Jesus ever before and you need Jesus in your life. I want to challenge you today, like I did, going up those stairs, said, Jesus, if you're going to do something, you're going to have to do it now. And then all of a sudden, God went to work over a four-day period. And on Thursday night, I listened to that guy said, if you want to walk with God and you want a healthier life, just ask and a teenage guy in the living room while his mom was in the bedroom praying for him decided to ask that. And the reason why I'm here today is because I prayed that prayer and my mom never stopped praying for me. And so I want to invite you over the tomorrow, we're going to talk about sin because in order to understand the good news, you have to understand the power of sin and what sin does to us, how awful it is to us because Sin, even though it's great, the grace and good news of the Bible is so much better. And it's only good news. And once we understand the good news and we start seeing Jesus for who he really is and seeing how loving he is and he's the exact representation of God the Father and we start to see the character of God that we are deeply loved, we will not forget that good news. And when Paul was sharing the gospel message, the good news everywhere, the Christian church caught on fire. And in a few short years, in a, in a lifetime, it had spread to the known world, to India, to China, to Northern Europe, to Africa. It was the first to share in Africa. And it spread everywhere because it was good news. And today, I want to invite you to that good news experience. So come tomorrow morning. You'll hear more of the good news. And the good news is you and I are all in the same boat. Saturday night, you'll hear more good news. And, and that's where I really dive into the good news and how good it is. Because it has very little to do with me. It all has to do with God. Amen. That's good news. Because if it has to do with me, I'll never get there. When it has to do with God, He'll take me there. And then on Sunday morning... I want to talk to you about the results of the good news. Because I really believe if people that want to be Christians follow the good news, it must mean we become changed people. And when we become changed people, people all around us start to look at us differently, saying, hey, I knew what you, what you want, once were, and I see what you are right now, and I want to know how that happened. You don't have to stand on a, preach, on a street corner preaching. All you have to do is live your life in Jesus with the good news. And that's enough.
God will bring people to you and he will put you up on a pedestal so people will watch you and go, that person has something that I don't have and I want what that person has. So let's bow our heads for prayer as we, uh, we close today. Now, I don't know if there's still music. Yes, there is music. All right. But let's just pray. Here, should we do the music first and then pray? Let's do the music first and then I'll come out and pray. Thank you. invite you to stand with us as we sing soon and very soon we are going to see the king. Because, Lord, when we give you a try, it is great. Amen. I've seen the other side, Lord, like with my cousin, Lord, who had everything going for him, but chose a lie. Chose a lie in his life, and it ended in death. And, Lord, I don't want that for anybody here. Amen. I don't want us to die alone on this world. I want to hold your hand for eternity. And Jesus, as we study this good news, this grace, Lord, that you have shared with us, and as we study it, we will know it's ours for eternity. So, Lord, thank you for the gift. Thank you for the good news. Help it to be truly good news to our lives. And, Lord, that faith door that starts to open, whether it's just a little crack or wide open, Lord, come in and change us to become loving, joyful, peaceful people. In your name I pray. Amen. Amen.
Fantastic. Thank you, folks. You may be seated. I just forgot to say we have several uh, very special guests. And if you guys look around, we have Pastor Brad Thor. Uh, he, there he is. We also have Pastor Dave Lawton and Erica. So thank you guys for coming. And everyone uh, who took time to come and visit us, folks, it's going to be, as you can see, I really enjoy the story, Paul. I, I never knew if this is the first time for me to hear your, your uh, testimony. So God bless you folks. Uh, see you tomorrow at 10 o'clock. God bless you. 10 o'clock.